the hardest part of children of raising a child, in my opinion, this is my opinion, is, is to really understand. <laughs> is that they take videos of you sleeping and put it on YouTube. <laughs> Today is the 100th episode of the Ken's Nearest Neighbors podcast. I wanted to do something special for this monumental occasion. So taking a page out of Lex Friedman's book, I brought my dad, Archie, in for an interview. This might sound like a weird choice since he's an oral surgeon and he has very little to do directly with data and the data domain. But honestly, this conversation was one of the most meaningful ones that I've had in my entire life. I was able to learn about my family history and take dedicated time to document the experiences that shaped who my dad is and his relationship with me. I don't think I've ever had quite as much of an appreciation for his life, his work, and his individual philosophy as I do now. For those tuning in, I hope this is a window into how our parents and our loved ones view our work, our happiness, and our decisions. I also hope that this inspires you to take the time to truly get to know the people in your life before the opportunity to do that dissipates. I hope you enjoy the episode. I know it was, it was pretty meaningful and monumental to me. Dad, thank you so much for coming on my podcast. This is a very special 100th episode for me. You know, obviously you've, you've known me, <laughs> you've known me my whole life, right? So I couldn't think of anyone better that I've learned more from throughout my life. Um, and I also think that anyone listening can get a lot about the, uh, out of this conversation because one, you know, you've given, in my mind, some really incredible advice to me as I've grown and developed, and especially as I've navigated my career. And also, a lot of people, they they probably have parents that have no clue what they do, have no clue why they're trying to get into the data domain. And I, I at least I think that you approve my career, and you coming from a, a traditional career as, as a doctor, as, as an oral surgeon, um, how you sort of wrapped your head around that. So Again, thank you so much for coming in, and I'm excited to dive into your story. Well, I'm actually very honored. Uh, you know, <laughs> this is kind of a unique experience, uh, and the fact is, that this is an epic uh, episode of your podcast at this time. So, so <laughs> I, I'm truly honored. So, this is, this is something I was looking forward to when you made a comment to me about. So I said, "Yeah, I'd love to." So, yeah, I'm, I'm more than happy to, to join your podcast. Excellent. Well, as, as everyone can tell, listening, I get my my sense of humbleness and humility from you. So, <laughs> but so, so jumping in, you know, I, I usually ask people about their background and how it relates to data, right? But I'm really interested in just your background in general. You, you, you know, you were an immigrant, you had, um, you know, not the easiest life growing up. What is something from your childhood that is still really prominent in your memory? You know, like when you look back, you're like, wow, that's something that happened. That's crazy. Well, you know, it, it, you're, you're right. I, I think uh, my background is unique, but not really unique to immigrants in general. Uh, I think if you look forward to it, you know, I was born at a time when it was just at the end of the World War II uh, and, and just the beginning of the Korean War. So that time period was a very awkward time in American and Asian history. And so at the time that I was still very, very young, um, we were still in, at that time, occupied uh, communist China, as they called it. Now, people don't realize that in the 1949-1950 era, that China was not totally, um, shall we say, completely uh, occupied by Mao Zedong the Communists. There were segments within China, and China is a huge country uh, in land that's larger than the United States. So you can imagine their areas of pockets. And so we were one, of, uh, my mother and myself were one of the few people that were able to get out of China at the very last airplane and fly into, at that time, uh, a coastal Chinese uh, community. And then we were able to navigate from that coastal area with boats at night into Hong Kong. Now, I was very young, so I don't have a lot of memory of that. But what I do have memory of it is the rushing and being on time and I got to be there at time. And I, I think that that concept has always instilled in me that always be on time, be early if you can, just from that kind of a, a setting in my background. Uh, once I was in Hong Kong, uh, then we lived there with some relatives, and 
you know, I think I explained to you once before is, is that your grandfather, my father, was a U.S. citizen, a Chinese uh, person who was actually born in Hawaii. And, I, and I'll go to that story a little later. And therefore became a, a Chinese citizen, a U.S. citizen. And he had been, believe it or not, uh, placed into the military. Um, and, you know, once they had solicited him into the military because of his U.S. citizenship, he came to the United States. And so my mother and I were alone in China. I then migrated, as I just said, to Hong Kong. And from there, we were trying to make our way to Hawaii, and then obviously from Hawaii, which is the territory, not a state at that time, and then meet my father in uh, the United States, where he was a uh, physician in the U.S. Army. And so that early childhood uh, kind of instilled in me some real ideas of, you know, I guess, timing. And then once I reached Hawaii, I mean, I, mean, I had vivid memories of being on a boat and looking out and seeing nothing, I mean, just forever. I mean, just absolutely nothing. And once we were in Hawaii, uh, unfortunately, uh, my mom, being the wife of, uh, of a U.S. citizen, was able to go to uh, the United States. But the immigration laws, especially for uh, Chinese, were so strict that they would not allow me to go into the United States because I was, quote, unquote, a non-citizen. And we are in a time of that beginning Korean War, and the anti-Asian sentiment was, was huge. So with that in mind, I was able to then at least stay in Hawaii, and I had relatives there. And so I stayed there by myself for many years. Uh, my mother was finally able to go to Hawaii. She left me with a uh, relative, and from there she went to Hawaii to greet and, and you know, uh, have a reunion with my father then. Uh, so I was stuck. I was stuck there. And so I remember uh, clearly, you know, being on my own. And I remember clearly when I did return, I was able to get in the United States. You know, that first meeting with my, uh, at that time, my dad. And then, of course, uh, they had my siblings that I didn't know about. I knew of them, but I, I obviously had not met them. So th those are my memories that I have of early childhood uh, as far as growing up. And I think the lesson learned is not only being on time, the lesson learned of, of being uh, independent on my own, uh, self-reliant. Um, and so, so those are really kind of the key points that I've taken away. Rather than it being a negative, uh, you know, I use it as a positive in my life as I move forward. Chuliko, I apologize for the airplane noise here. It's a little unavoidable. <laughs> But, you know, I think that, that those are really important lessons that you've instilled in me. I mean, from a very early age, I mean, you, you, you've preached to me that, you know, working for yourself or having control over your own destiny is something that is, is a really powerful thing. You never want your life to be controlled by someone else. And you clearly felt that when you were a child because, you know, you're, you're escaping an oppressive government. You know, you're, you're, you're being taken all over the place and there are things like the law of the country with immigration that are out of your control and unbelievably frustrating. So it's kind of cool for me to see like, okay, this is what shaped, you know, some of the thought process behind my dad and like why he thinks in this certain way or why that was such a core value to you as you were, you were growing up or, or even as, as you've like maintained as a tenant going forward. So you're in Hawaii for, for some time. How did you eventually move to the continental United States, right? Or, or like the, the mainland, as we call it here? So it's a very interesting story. Uh, and in fact, it can be well documented. But what had happened is I had mentioned before that um, my father, your grandfather, was a physician in the U.S. Army. And at that time, uh, as a physician, uh, he had gone to medical school in China. And then he, in order to come to the United States, he uh, actually did a residency in the United States. And my father, who was very enterprising and in his own way, um, very bright about doing things, looked at an area of medicine that he could practice that there weren't that many specialists in, and therefore he would be unique. And it ended up being, of course, he chose pulmonary medicine. So pulmonary medicine is diseases of the lungs. 
And at that time, you know, there were just that, not many pulmonologists at all. The people were internists, people were cardiologists, uh, you know, orthopedic surgeons, but pulmonary pulmonologists were just not unusual at that time. So he went into pulmonary medicine and they assigned him to go to Colorado, at Colorado Springs, sort of the U.S. Army base there. And when he was there, of course, there, because of Colorado, it's well known that the atmosphere there and the, um, and the environment was better for respiratory diseases. And when he was there, he happened to have many patients that were well known um, soldiers as well as statesmen and legislators. And he met a Senator William Morton. And, and Senator Morton was from Kentucky. And Senator Morton had a respiratory disease of COPD. Um, so at that time, he treated Senator Morton, and he uh, really appreciated my dad's treatment. And subsequently, the Secretary of State likewise had a, uh, a disorder with uh, severe asthma, or uh, adult onset asthma, which was unusual. And somehow or another, they collaborated, and they found out about my being in China, uh, in Hawaii. And because of my Chinese birth, I was unable to come to the United States, uh, to the mainland. And they actually instituted a bill in Congress, a special privilege bill that was added to a war reparations bill. And that allowed for me to enter China under special conditions and getting special citizenship. So that's how I got to the United States. I mean, it's very interesting how that occurred. But uh, yes, that, that's how I came here to the United States. And that bill was initiated in 61. Right, right in the 60s, it was, it was initiated. Oh, but, so there you have it. My dad, RG, part of U.S. history. <laughs> that's correct. <laughs> it's, it actually, if you look it up, it's actually in the uh, congressional records uh, in Library of Congress. That's really cool. And so, you know, you get home, you, you see your parents after quite some time. Going back, how do you think your parents would describe you? Or how would your siblings describe Well, maybe, maybe each one of your siblings would describe you differently. <laughs> Um, but you know, like what, what was that experience like essentially like rejoining a family after being gone for, for quite a period of time? And like, you know, was there a dissonance because of that? You know, you're used to being independent and you're going back into a household, an Asian household where, <laughs> where there is like expectations. Um, how did you manage that? Well, it was, it was difficult. Uh, my father had moved, uh, that time that the whole family had moved to, um, Cleveland, Ohio where my father was the physician, left the military, and is now a physician with uh, Cleveland Clinic and uh, under a university uh, program. And so they had moved to a place called Sunny Acres, uh, right outside of Cleveland. And it was this classical 1950s suburban area that you actually see on, on TV, where the homes were all set up and, and it was a uh, planned home area. And I remember coming there, and the first thing I felt when I when I came there was I was cold. I mean, you know, coming from Hawaii, and then all of a sudden going to Cleveland, Ohio. And even though it was late, uh, it was early fall at the time. You know, I, I remember one is that boy, this looks bleak, and I am cold. Uh, my reunion with my family actually wasn't that complicated. I mean, I was one really happy to see my mom again, of course. And then meet my uh, siblings. I have one brother and two sisters. You have an uncle and two aunts. And, you know, and my father, you know, was, I, I think he was probably um, more concerned than I was. Um, and I think looking back and then talking to him over time, my, my father always sort of had a, an idea that I was on my own. He really did interfere with my life significantly. I mean, he would offer advice, he would offer comment, but from a standpoint of being disciplined or a standpoint of um, typically being a disciplinary of sorts, he was not to me. So I think there was some dichotomy between how I was treated and compared to my other siblings. But on the other hand, I think my other siblings looked at me just a little bit differently as well. And so, yeah, I mean, even to this day, I mean, they're, they're, you can tell that although we have a very good relationship, loving relationship, a family relationship, that I'm treated just a little bit differently 
uh, just because of my background. And, you know, they're all aware of my background, you know. And so I, I think my, one of my sisters made a comment that she didn't know if she could have survived if she was totally on her own without, you know, a mom and dad there and whatnot. So I, I think the reunion was, I didn't remember as being anything but happiness. And uh, I think the reunion on both ends was really kind of nice to see another person. And I think if you think about it yourself, of all of a sudden you realize, oh, I have this relative and, and they're coming over. I mean, how happy everyone is. So, yeah, I, I think it was in today's world, the language would be seamless. Well, so, I mean, it, it seems like obviously the cold was a big thing, like relocating to a new a new place. I mean, uh, uprooting, you know, I think you had friends and things like that in Hawaii and making that adjustment. Um, h- how was it integrating with school? How was it integrating to other aspects of your life? And how did that drive your, your future of like what you wanted to do with your life? Right. So you come in every story I've ever heard about you during your younger years is that you were like unbelievably motivated. You're in the band, you're playing sports, you're the best student, you were doing all these things at an early age. Where did all of that come from? Like, why did you want to excel in all of those things? Why did you want to take on so many things? You know, like what was the motivation behind that? Well, there were a couple of motivations that, that I felt and I had a discussion with my mom and my, my mother made a comment that, you know, it's different here than in China and, and in Hawaii. And that here in Hawaii, or especially in China, I mean, everybody's is Asian, everybody's Chinese. Uh, everybody kind of looks like you or not. And in Cleveland, Ohio, uh, I went to a, a high school and that high school was not a large high school, uh, I mean, certainly uh, in that area. And I was literally the only other Asian there. And I realized that everyone sort of looked at me a little differently. And so, you know, I, I took on the, the thought that, you know, I would try to integrate myself to be like everyone else. And my mother made a comment and, and said, you know, what? you're never going to be like everyone else because you don't look like everyone else. And so you have to make your own way. And I thought about that. And it clearly occurred to me that to make your own way, you have to establish yourself. And to establish yourself, then you have to be as good as everyone else and even better. And I learned that lesson really early in life. And so I was motivated to do well. And I was motivated to excel. And I was motivated to do the best I could do. And I learned very quickly that, you know, if you are at the top of whatever pyramid you want to go to, then people respect you more, they look at you more equally, and they look at you from the standpoint of being inclusive. And I think that that's key to a part of my entire outlook and philosophy is, is that if you do well and excel well. And then, of course, you know, now as an adult, you look at it and you say, you know what? that internalizes as well. And therefore that internalization allows you to have a certain amount of pride, a certain amount of self-confidence. And if you will, it allows you to have, you know, a a whole uh, identity of yourself. And so the issues of your, your differences really don't matter. So I think all those areas of being where you are one of many that looked like the same, had the same concepts, same culture, because Hawaiian culture is roughly a lot Asian culture that's mixed in with American culture. And when you come, obviously, to the United States and you go into the Midwest, like Cleveland, Ohio, you know, that culture changes dramatically. And, you know, in order to navigate those types of different types of cultures, you have to be able to have a certain amount of self uh, confidence to do that. And that self dominant emanates, and other people are aware of that. And so that allows you to be your own self. You know, it's, it's really interesting that you had that experience at that age. I mean, I felt like in a lot of ways, in a very strange way, I felt something very similar, right? You know, going to high school, going to middle school, whatever it might be, 
once people start to identify like, oh, this person looks different or whatever it might be, I mean, like, weird, weird things start to happen, right? So it wasn't that I was the only Asian person, right? I mean, there's plenty of Asian people. There's plenty of Chinese people I went to high school with. My, my upbringing is very diverse. But, you know, the thing is, I'm, I'm like half Chinese. I'm not totally Chinese. And the Chinese kids, I didn't speak Chinese. Like, I didn't fit in with them. Same with the, the white kids is that, or, or any other, any other group is that I'm not completely them or I'm not necessarily affiliated with them. And so I found myself very much like you were the only Asian person. I feel like a lot of the time I was the only person that, that fit in with my specific subset. Right. And to me, I think that was really, it was scary because I felt alone a lot, but at the same time, it was unbelievably liberating to say, hey, I can define my own category. I can like establish my own identity. I don't have to fall into any of these neat groups. And that's helped me be significantly more entrepreneurial. It's helped me think about a lot of a lot of the situations that I run into is I don't have to think about it like XYZ person or this other person. I can think about it in my can completely own way because I don't have to fall into this very neat little group either. I obviously didn't find that um, you know, the ability to separate myself from those groups as easy, uh, or like the, the path to doing that as early on. I mean, I found sports was like a very easy way for me to, to establish my own category and, and <laughs> largely individual sports as I, as I grew older. Right. But it, it's, it's, I don't, I wouldn't say it's poetic, but it's, it's really interesting to see that that mindset that you cultivated, which I think I also have the, the sort of fierce independence and wanting to control your own destiny. It was shaped by our backgrounds and our experiences that were different, but, but similar in the way that there was some, I wouldn't say isol isolationism, but you have to look at the world very differently when you're the only, right? You, you have to approach problems very differently if you're the only one. And I think that that's, you know, a, a lesson I'm, I'm very happy that I learned. At the time, I probably wasn't as grateful. <laughs> but now looking back, I, I'm really, really appreciative of it. Well, it, it's hard to identify individualism and have the confidence of, of utilizing that uh, at an early age. And I think I was probably luckier if you look back at it, uh, looking at the positives than the negative of being fiercely dependent on my own for so much, so many years. Uh, and I, you know, I lived with an aunt, a very loving aunt, um, who didn't have any other children, or she was never married. Uh, so she had no experience as far as raising children. You know, so quite frankly, she really allowed me to do uh, almost anything I wanted to do. Um, and, and that probably allowed me to have a, fat, a, a faster trajectory in growth. Uh, and so, you know, I look at all of those issues, even though at the time as a young child growing up, you were wondering what's going on, but allowed to do as a positive note, it really uh, expedited your trajectories in, in life in a lot of ways. Yeah. Well, you know, it's, it's sort of funny that is almost the opposite or very contrary to traditional Asian parenting, right? And, you know, I, I saw this myself. I think you'll probably agree. I mean, I wouldn't say you guys were like the most strict disciplinarians, but I mean, th there was things that I could definitely not do. And there are things that I could do. Um, and I was your guys' first child and only child. And so I think that there's a little additional level of, of like protectionism or, or things like that. And, it, you know, it wasn't until I left where I had that independence that I found who I was. And it took some time after that. Um, and, you know, I, I think that that is, that is something that I, I've relished in American culture is the, the, like, the need to understand or learn yourself. But there's obviously other really benefits, huge benefits of, of the Asian culture elements of hard work and those types of things. But hopefully, you know, I find both, both of those in myself uh, and have been able to, to really like build those tenants into any of the successes that I've, that I've had so far. I, I think one of the other issues too that I bring up is that I, I think my whole tenant on education really comes from my parents. You know, my mother, um, 
uh, actually graduated from college uh, with a social degree in economics, and their father, I guess, was a physician. And so their belief was that education was the leveler. Education was the leveler in everything. And that education is something that could never be taken away from you. And education, in fact, would allow you to succeed in, in all sorts of areas. And I think that uh, were my thoughts about being academically strong. And to this day, as you all know, I mean, I'm a, my main tenet in life is being, you know, educationally strong and knowledgeable. Is it comes from them, and that resource allowed me to do that area. And and luckily, I was, you know, I was fairly athletic, so you know, I have an athletic background, and I, you know, I loved sports, and so I was able to, you know succeed fairly well in both areas academically and, and, and in athletics so I, I think you know I was able to pick up pearls of wisdom all the way through and so you know people will walk and ask me your mentors and whatnot I mean you, know, you have so many mentors that allow you these pearls as you move forward and as long as you're willing to to accept what people are telling you and then try it in your own mind or try it to see if it works for you or not uh, I, I think that those are key elements of success in life. I mean, that is something that in your younger years, maybe not as much as you've gotten older, that, I, that I've always admired about you is your willingness to experiment and try and learn about what you like and what you don't like. I think that that's something that, um, you know, you've, you encouraged me to do. I played so many sports that I did not want to play growing up. I went to all these different, you know, classes and these types of things that I... I didn't enjoy, but I wouldn't have known that I didn't enjoy them unless I tried them, right? I don't think we left too many things on the table where it's like, hey, you know, I, I, I didn't at least try and experiment with this. And there are a lot of those things that I did try eventually really did like. I mean, that has been something that, um, you know, that, that I had to pick up. I mean, as a kid, I can't think of too many things that I just like wanted to go out and try, right? I needed to get that little kickstart. And as I've gotten older, I try, you know, I, if I could, I would eat a new food or I literally eat something different every single meal because I enjoy the experience of largely food, but trying, trying new things on that front, which I think is really cool. Uh, you know, my, my father, your grandfather had this philosophy that you should learn something new every year of your life. And it could be anything, but you learn something new, whether it's a language, um, whether it was juggling, whether it was uh, a new talent, um, but something that's absolutely new to you every year of your life. And, you know, I really try to follow a lot of that. Um, not one is because it's the uniqueness. Two is the curiosity. And three is that it's really kind of invigorating to learn something new. And not that you have to master it, but you could actually say, you know, really, I enjoy this and therefore I want to continue it. Or you could say, you know, I tried that and I don't want it. So similar to eating, you know, new different styles of food and whatnot, it's the same kind of concept. But that curiosity and that adventurousness uh, that I think allows you to grow your mind and, and and grow you as a person. So that whole concept, if you recall, when I said try something new every year, you know, comes from, you know, your grandfather. And I think he got it from his father, to be honest about it. Interesting. Well, so, you know, I never got to meet my grandfather. Um, I got, met my grandmother, obviously, when I was very little. I have some memories, but I think she passed away when I was, what, 10? Something like that? Yeah, well, you probably were, younger you, than you that, were seven. Three. Three? three. That young? Yeah. Wow. I guess that is... My memory is a little fuzzy, but I, I digress. Um, tell me about my grandparents. Like, how do you remember them without going into like too much depth? But like, well, I, I think when you look at your grandmother, she was fiercely loyal, loving, and caring. Uh, it was amazing because she grew up in a home that was a well-to-do. Her, her father, her great grandfather, was a, a physician, and it's very interesting that he is was a physician in Chinese medicine and then subsequently discovered Western medicine. And he actually went to the United States and 
went to Harvard and taught anatomy there at the same time getting a medical license, a medical degree at Harvard. And it's when they left Harvard after being there for, I guess, eight, nine years, and then they came going back to China to, to show what he had learned, uh, is, is how he has the experience in New English. And because of that, he actually went into China and outside of Shanghai is a town called Suzhou. Suzhou is a beautiful city with all sorts of gardens. And he built an American style home. And because of that, he really was creative and unique that he not only built a hospital, but he also built a dairy farm. And then subsequently a, a farm to sustain it. So within that hospital, he was able to sustain all of the necessary elements uh, as sustainability goes. And with that, my mother grew out of that home. And she had experience of being a nurse, helping my father. And she was, she had uh, five siblings as well. There were six in the family. Um, she had, uh, I'm sorry, five sister siblings and two male siblings. So it was a rather large family. And from there, she herself uh, went through college, which is very unusual in, you know, again, 1920s China, 1930s China. So you can imagine. So, so she was very unique. And when she came to America, I mean, she was used to living well. Of course, during the war, it was difficult. But, you know, she learned everything on her own, how to cook, how to attend housekeeping, raise children. Where in China, when she was growing up, she would have little bit of Chinese servants called omas. And so it was unique. So she was fiercely able to adapt adjust and make a living. My father, your grandfather, uh, was unique in his way. I mean, he, he came from a family where his father passed away very young. Your great-grandfather passed away, I believe, uh, in his very early 40s. And uh, he left. Uh, my father was the only boy, you know, the only son. And I have six siblings, which, and so he was the youngest and uh, apparently he was independent as well. My great-grandmother who raised him uh, worked and she also learned English and it's unique also that the history of his, of my, your grandfather's father was the fact that he also was a physician. He also practiced in Beijing and he practiced for at that time the Emperor's family and they sent him to the United States to learn Western medicine. And he was in Boston University at the same time your other great-grandfather was at Harvard. And they had met, and you know, unknowingly. But nevertheless, uh, and then when he came back to China, he, he died prematurely. And my uh, great-grandmother then raised the children and she gave English lessons, piano lessons. She tutored and she was very well known for her singing. And so she would go on exhibitions and she would train singers. She was well known in, in Beijing as being a, the music scholar. And uh, my father couldn't carry a tune to save his life. I mean, was, and, and nor can I. I mean, so that, that, that's the, but, but my father himself, uh, as a young man, was a courier for the U.S. Army, and he learned English that way. He um, put himself through school because obviously they didn't have a lot of money. And then he, he himself went to medical school and he worked in the anatomy department in order to afford that. Uh, he would deliver food. Uh, he was, he's actually, he was even there. Uh, did laundry, I mean, you know, your grandfather did everything. And then when he was, Enlisted, uh, not enlisted, but he was actually enlisted out of the, in the army because he was a U.S. citizen. I mean, you know, he continued. The interesting thing about your great grandfather, however, is that after he left the army and went to Cleveland Clinic, he decided to go to private practice. Well, you can have a medical license in the military, and you can have military, and you can have a license to go with the university. But if you go into private practice, 
you have to get your own license in medicine. And because he didn't go to medical school, although he did a residency, they wouldn't allow him the privilege to sit for the exam and to take the license. And so he fought tooth and nail. In fact, uh, he uh, actually got an attorney to petition to the uh, Ohio State at that time to get a, a license in medicine. And he was able to petition it and so they gave him a one-time only opportunity to pass the exam. Now, my poor father at that time, you know, if you recall, was a pulmonologist. But that license, medical license exam, was on everything, including OBGYN, pediatric medicine, some things that my father had not studied or, or looked at for many, many years. And to his credit, under, the, you know, those are dire circumstances of eating or not eating, or practicing medicine or being a doctor, and he was able to pass the exam. So, you know, it was quite to his credit to be able to, and at the same time, you gotta remember, now he's got four children, he's gotta put food on the table, he had to work, so he doesn't really have to study. And likewise, if you remember that in those days, they didn't have testing agencies, they didn't have help book reading. And so he had no idea what the exam was like, and no idea. And he didn't have any connections that he could like ask people about, well, what's this exam like, or what questions are they focus on. So he did it all on his own, so that was to his credit. So again, independent, adaptable, uh, resilient. I mean, I, I speak to my parents that way. That's awesome. I mean, it, it helps to paint a better perspective. Obviously, I wish I could have met them, but um, <laughs> I think that one's, a, that one's uh, off, off, the, off the books now. But, um, you know, switching gears just a little bit, you know, when you were a kid, when you were growing up, what did you want to be when you grew up? When, did you have any ideas about profession? I mean, um, you know, obviously there were a lot of doctors in, in the family. Um, we'll talk on, on that and be not going down that profession uh, on, in a little bit, but I'm interested if that was really what you were excited about, or if there were other things that that you were fascinated with. From the time from the time I was eight years old until I was say sixteen, seventeen, I want to be a catcher with the New York Yankees. That, that was it. That, that that was my sole goal in life is I want to be a catcher with the New York Yankees. And uh, I worked fiercely at it, too. I mean, you know, obviously, you know, there were, in those days, uh, size didn't matter as much. I mean, in today's world, in baseball and whatnot, you know, the athleticism, you know, if you're not six foot tall and weighing at least 185, 190, uh, in, in those days, I mean, you, you could be a very well, agile. You got the weight down. <laughs> I, mean, I know, I got the weight down. But... But it, but in those days, so you know, it wasn't out of the realm, and and I worked fiercely at, at you know switch hitting, batting right and left, so that I could be versatile. But yeah, that that was my goal from about eight until sixteen seventeen. And what happened at sixteen seventeen? You know, I, I actually got interested in engineering. Um, I, I had read several books. So, you know, one one of the criteria, you know, and I digress, but one one of the criteria of my my mother had always wanted uh, us in the summertime. Uh, we had actually moved from Cleveland now, and my father was in private practice, and, and we had moved to, to uh, Southern Ohio, right outside of Cincinnati, and my dad had a private practice. And in the summers, uh, there was no such thing as real summer school then. And so my mother had said that everyone really needs to uh, keep up with education by reading. And so one of the things that I decided I wanted to do is I wanted to read the entire Encyclopedia Britannica uh, over the course of you know, a couple of summers. And I, and I got involved with engineering. I, I, I fell in love with uh, uh, Michelangelo, uh, Leonardo da Vinci, and, and those drawings. I, mean, I, I got fascinated by it. And so I decided I would go into engineering. And so I just kind of moved in that direction and so when I went to college, I, mean, I applied to college for engineering. And uh, that's what I really thought in my mind that I really wanted to do. So I, I moved in that direction. How did your parents feel about you looking into studying engineering compared to medicine? 
Well, you know, there was there was never ever um, any real pressure about going into medicine. I think my mom and dad felt that medicine was an honorable uh, and a, a, a profession that you know that you would do something good for. And I think my father made a comment to me, and I make that I think I make the same comment to you: is that as long as you do something in your life that is through welfare of people, you know, is for the best interest, you know, and you enjoy it. I mean, you, gotta, you have to go into a profession of passion, and they believe that, and I believe it. you got to have passion. You could do anything you want to do, and if you have passion for it, then that's good for you. You go into a profession that you have no passion, then you really shouldn't belong there. So if you decided, like, you wanted to go into medicine because of me, for example, and that wasn't your passion, then I would tell you, don't do it. If you don't go into a profession that you love, that you enjoy going to do every day, and you feel like you're doing good in it, then you should pick something else. And I, and, I, and to their credit, that was exactly, you know, my father would love to have me go into medicine. In fact, you know, one of the things we we'll talk about later is the fact that, you know, if I'd gone into medicine, he and... and and my uncle at the time, my, my mother's brother, who was also a physician, uh, you know, they would have loved for me to go practice with them. Okay. Um, but, you know, they really didn't pressure me per se, but they clearly would have said, if you go into medicine, you're going to practice with us. So, so it was a different type of subtle type of pressure, but it, it wasn't specifically about being a doctor. So, I mean, you're starting in engineering. How do you end up in medicine, actually? So, so I, 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 I got accepted to a couple of engineering schools. And obviously one of the big concerns about was at, at that time is the cost. And so I got a, a, a small scholarship uh, in Ohio because I, we lived in Ohio. And so I went to Case Institute of uh, Engineering. You know, and it's combined with you know a, the other college called Adelbo College of Men. And it's a combination of Case West Preserve. So why didn't you go to Harvard? You had legacy. I'm realizing now that I also have legacy. Well, one one is I didn't get accepted to Harvard. Um, I applied to Harvard. I, I didn't with get, legacy? Yeah, with legacy. But it wasn't legacy because someone had, had attended it. It was, the, it was someone who actually talked to it. Yeah, okay, I was so different. Okay. So it's a little different from that standpoint, too. And also what happened was is that... Um, I hate to say it, but Harvard, Yale, and some of the other schools, I, and I was accepted to Yale, uh, those other schools had limitations and quotas on Asians attending the college. And I was told, uh, in fact, I don't even think, I, my mom used to have the letter. I was told that I was an alternate list for an Asian position. So, in other words, if one of the agents dropped out, I would be on the offer list <coughs> to go to, to Harvard. <coughs> Which, you know, fair or not fair, that's the way it was. You know, you're talking about the 19, late 60s, 70s, you know. But that's, that's the way it is. And so, no, I, I didn't go to Harvard. And I didn't go to Yale because I had no scholarship. And the cost was astronomical for my parents. So I went to Case. Uh, and uh, finished Case. I enjoyed it. I was a mechanical engineer. And uh, I really, really loved uh, mechanical engineering. Now, in those days, it's pre-computerized. So one of the big issues in which I excelled in was the meticulous drawings. And those meticulous drawings, well, you know, took hours and weeks to do. I mean, and it was something that I enjoyed. I mean, you would have this beautiful draft drawing of a building, a bridge, or whatever you wanted to create, and, and I love that. Unfortunately, is that when I graduated and I looked for a job in mechanical engineering, there were no jobs. There were draftsman's positions, and I couldn't afford to go out and open a shop myself. So that summer, I mean, I'm, I'm really kind of desperate, and obviously I know my mom and dad can't afford to keep me. Um, around. And uh, my college roommate, uh, a guy by the name of Roman Rangel, who was uh, 
He's a really great guy, funny and great. But anyway, um, he was going to dental school. And his father was a dentist in, uh, in Cleveland, outside of Cleveland. And he says, go to dental school with me. And I said, well, you know, I said, you know, no, he says, you know, you got the grades, you got everything you can do, go ahead. And, you know, all you need is take organic chemistry, you can take it this summer. So he says, you know, apply and take the exam. So I said, well, fine, I'll take the exam and uh, we'll see what happens. And uh, after that, it was history. I went to dental school, I got accepted to several dental schools. Uh, University of Louisville uh, accepted me and they gave me almost not quite a full scholarship. I said, wow, I mean, what's better than this, you know? So I went to dental school. Well, you know, it's funny. So for those listening, I've seen some of your, your drawings from dental school of your notes. And like, they should be in a museum somewhere. I mean, you really carried that over. But they sound so different, right? Engineering and, and dentistry. But the part you loved about the engineering probably was the drawings. That's something you had passion for, working with your hands. Dental school, surgery, like the form of medicine that you do, you're working with your hands all the time. And I think it's, it's, it's really interesting to see that those two really far disciplines have that thing in common that you really enjoyed. And I, I've seen you work, I've seen you talk, and you, you clearly have a passion for what you do now, which I think is pretty incredible. Well, you know, it, it's interesting you brought that up because what happens is I went to dental school. Once I got into dental school, after the first two years of dental school, I said, why am I here? Because I don't enjoy this. And then my third year, I, I was actually, I was speaking to my father, uh, and I was explaining to him, and uh, he said, well, switch over to med school. He said, you know, I got the grades to go to medical school. And so I actually went over to the medical school and talked to them about switching over. Uh, but before that decision occurred, I took a rotation in oral surgery. And all of a sudden, I said, whoa, this, this is really interesting. I mean, this is really unique. And the area of oral surgery, which is unique, that people don't appreciate it, is that most you know, the populace looks at oral surgeons as, oh, you're a dentist, you know, you take out teeth, you take out wisdom teeth. Well, that's true for a office-based practice. But the other side of oral surgery, which is called oral maxillofacial surgery, is actually reconstructing the entire face. And that is after trauma, post-cancer surgeries. And also, you know, you talk about craniofacial, you know, deformities. And that whole area became now all of a sudden a very interesting area because it took all of my mechanical engineering background to now go forward with reconstructing a face. So you could take a face and you can imagine in today's world, you know, a person in a motorcycle, and, and this is an actual case, was riding, doing weaving back and forth, slides on the gravel, bike gives away, and his face smashes into a sign and then every bone in their face is broken and smashed in. They're still alive. Their brain is intact, but every bone in their face, so not only the cheekbones, well, the eye orbits, obviously their nose and the whole jaw is just smashed flat. And so to reconstruct them back to where they were originally, putting all the bones in place, building the scaffolds to support it, all of a sudden became my mechanical engineering background that supports all this. And so all of a sudden I thought to myself, wow, this is something I can do. And so all of a sudden I was reinvigorated and I said, you know what, I'm going to go do this. And where my past background of being tenacious, academically strong, allowed me to go forward to it because, you know, it, it's obviously an area that's uh, highly sought after and very competitive too. And that also inspired my juices. Wow, well, you know, it's competitive and inspiring to get in that area. So all of a sudden, I mean, that came, became my focus. So that's how I moved into pro mass surgery. That's awesome. I didn't know the, the history behind that decision. It seems like it was very 
um, skill and passion oriented. I mean, I, I talk with on on this podcast a lot of people who have navigated their careers, and it seems like there's some sort of secret sauce between not just passion and interest, which you found in that specific subset of the discipline, but also aptitude, right? Like you had this sort of unique blend of skills that I would imagine most people in dental school did not have an engineering background, right? Um, that could make you excel and understand it in a different way. It's, well, you know, just to give me an imagination on this issue, let's just assume that, you know, you break your jaw here and here. Well, the jaw bone itself is just hung by itself. There's a joint here, but there's nothing that hangs this bone to the rest of your body, the rest of your skull, other than some tendons. So if this piece breaks or this piece breaks, you got nothing hanging. So in order to have that supported, it's no different than a suspension bridge. And the bridge goes over and, and you've got two pillar points at one spot. Well, depending on the length of the bridge, you have to be able to support it in the middle somehow. And the easiest, of course, is to put a pillar in. But what if you can't put a pillar in? How would you support it? So now you've got a suspension bridge. Same concept. You're supporting the mandible with no middle pillar, and you're doing it by suspension. And so that mechanical engineering background and knowledge brings it right to this table right off the bat. No different than if you smash your cheap point in, you got to pull it out, but how do you keep it out there? Okay, so in order that bone, because it'll just kind of collapse. It'll just kind of fall in. If you pull it back out again, the muscles will cheap. As soon as you smile, it'll pull it back again. So again, how do you support that? And that's all mechanical engineering and that's learning. And so in a lot of ways, my background allows me to see the picture quicker than some of my biology colleagues who study biology. And the way that they approach it and the way I would approach it is uh, significantly different. Now the results in some cases may be the same, but I like to think my results are that much better. And obviously I've been very successful at it. And therefore, you know, there's some, some of my techniques are being accepted by others. And so, yeah, that, that background has helped a lot. And I think I pride in that background. Yeah. Well, I mean, that, that is just a, a recurring theme with almost everyone I talk to is that like the things that make us different, there are often things that make us better at our work, right? If everyone has the same skill set, we're not improving, we're not innovating. I mean, the thing that makes progress in nature is randomness, is, is defects actually, right? Yep. And if the defects or the, the evolution or the mutation is positive, then it sticks with the population. If it, if it is not positive, then it'll die out. And I think in this, in this circumstance, like where you are dealing with structural elements, like I wouldn't say they have to go as far as teaching an engineering no. class in, 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 uh, in your, uh, in dental school, but taking from those concepts and figuring out how to integrate them in would probably be useful. I mean, until physics at the end of the day in terms of what can hold weight. And so, I mean, that to me, it, it, it shows to me that this is a universal concept, not just something that's specific to the data domain, which is, I think, one of the really cool things about, about having a conversation with you is that I get to see this acted out over the course of one, my entire life, your entire life, a completely different profession and see so many common threads at the same time. This episode of Ken's Nearest Neighbors is brought to you by Z by HP, HP's high compute workstation grade line of products and solutions. Z is specifically made for high performance data science solutions. And I personally use the ZBook Studio and the Z4 workstation. I really love that the Z workstations can come standard with Linux and they can be configured with the data science software stack. With the stack, you can get right into doing the data science work on day one, without the overhead of having to completely reconfigure your new machine. Now back to our show. So with your career, how it has progressed to this day, I mean, you're, you're technically retired now. Would you have gone about it any way differently, you know, with the things that you've learned? Or is it like, hey, I, I enjoyed this career. I wouldn't have wanted to do anything else. Well, as I reflect on it, the answer to it is yes and no. I mean, I, I, I love my career path and track. Uh, and I think that one step led to the next step, to the next step. And so, you know, it's, it's hard to say how you would change that. I mean, if you look at it from a pure 
science fiction standpoint, if you change one factor, some of the other factors change. But what I would have done differently if I were to do it over again is a couple of decisions that, that you know, I, I would, in my own mind, I would have been better suited, although you don't know if that's occurred. I mean, when I, I did a uh, fellowship in Cardiff, Wales, in um, uh, cleft palate surgery, and I had an opportunity to go to France to, to study with one of the most renowned, renowned uh, surgeons, um, one of them, Tessier. And I decided not to go. I had already been away for six months out of the country. And, and you were dating my mom at the time. I was dating so. your mom at the time. <laughs> she probably wouldn't have liked that. Yeah. And my, my mom was invited to come on the show. She respectfully declined. So <laughs> we're focusing on this guy here. <laughs> yeah. But, and so that was one issue. And I was also running out of funds, too, to be honest about it. Because although I was, I was getting some type of, you know, a stipend, a stipend in, in Cardiff, I wouldn't have got a stipend in, in France. So that, that was one, uh, one decision that I regret that I didn't make. Uh, but other than that, I really, I really don't have, you know, really misgivings about anything. I mean, I would live the same life again, you know. Yeah, I mean, I, not something. I may, I may have wanted, <clears throat> I may have wanted to have a daughter. So that's, <laughs> that's, a, that's a separate issue altogether. You know? Well, there's a whole, a whole another can of worms that comes with that. So, well, if, if you were to have a daughter, what, what would you have named her? Uh, you know, I, in all honesty, I would, I would push for Victoria after my mom, you know. I mean, your mom would have had a lot to say so about that, but nevertheless, I, I think that, uh, you know, I, and, and she, she was an exceptional woman in my mind. Yeah, yeah. that's incredible. I mean, it, it's interesting what you say about in retrospect, and I probably developed some of this mindset from you as well, but like, there's no way to know how it would have gone otherwise, right? And every decision that I've made, everything that I've done has made me who I am now. Assuming, you know, I like who I am now, then I, I guess I probably wouldn't change anything because it could have turned out completely different and we never would have, we never would have known what it would have been either way. Yeah. There's, there's, and you know, from working with data, I know that like, like if we're running a simulation, there's hundreds of thousands, millions of times you run it and very rarely, if you have enough variables, though, they come out the same. And it's, it's, so hard to predict why why would we hinge all of this on a on a single decision or anything along those lines um so you, you were talking about your you know we're talking about your career but your career isn't just singular faceted right you've worked as an oral oral maxillofacial surgeon you've, you've had this engineering background you've done a lot of these things but now your world is actually quite different you're doing significantly less oral surgery as you're doing, I wouldn't call it, call it politics, but as you're doing uh, advocacy or working with making the profession of oral surgery, surgery dentistry, and medicine uh, a better place. How did you get into that, and what does that even entail? Like, you know, I'm, I'm being intentionally vague about it, so you can explain it, because I could not explain it very well. So, so what happens is, is that uh, as any profession that you belong to, their parameters, and those parameters are usually governed by outside forces. For example, the insurances and how they affect you know medicine and dentistry. Uh, another parameter is the law and you know definitions and whatnot. How do we regulate dentistry? And regulations and all those issues, and so they come to play. So the first area that you look at as an oral maxillofacial surgeon is the fact is that how do you judge criteria background? I mean, are all oral maxillofacial surgeons equal? And so you take a person in today's world, you could do a four-year residency and have, maintain your single degree. In my day, you would do a six-year residency and you would go to medical school. And then you could either get a medical degree or not, depending upon uh, what you want to do. And then in today's world, again, you could do a six-year residency and get a medical degree if you choose to go ahead. So you also have a medical degree? So I did not have a medical degree. I went okay. to medical school. Okay. okay so I, did, I, I took the opt not to get the medical degree at that time. And again, the question is, well, are you happy with that? Or, you know, Well, number one is the medical degree makes no difference in my scope of practice. However, it makes a huge difference in malpractice insurance. 
So if I practice under my dental degree, then my malpractice insurance is 50% less than if I practice with a medical degree as well. So there's a lot of time factors and economic factors in my day in practice. But those concepts of how you regulate equality are usually done by the professional organization. So for example, if you're a pharmacist, you belong to the American Association of Pharmacists, and the American Association of Pharmacists then regulates basically how you practice pharmacy in the big world picture. In our my profession is oral maxillofacial surgery. And in oral maxillofacial surgery, what I was seeing is, is that I was seeing that there were trends that were going on that were trends that, in my opinion, uh, I was not really for. I was really kind of against those trends. And one of those trends, the fact is, is that they really wanted to keep the uh, education of oral medical surgeons narrow and focused as being U.S. only. Well, this is a big world out there. And the education that we just talked about earlier about studying in Europe and abroad with Tessier or with Gazer or, or whomever is you should be able to bring that kind of education into your, your curriculum and into your own personal CV. And they should be accounted for. Whereas, you know, that was not being allowed. So here you have a person who has graduated from the United States, did four years of weather, and then decided to go study abroad for five years and bring it forward. That's five years of intense study it was not uh, accepted. And so that's one of the issues that, that, that I was really against. And so I decided to be involved with the association in order to make some enact some changes and I was lucky enough to be involved. Now I'm saying this sarcastically lucky enough because all of these areas of professions are usually very competitive election processes. So you need to not only be a representative of your state, which means that you have to join your state society and be elected by all your peers in your state society to represent them in a national society. And so you take, uh, you know, a state of Maryland, and you've got several hundred plus oral mastery surgeons, and they all belong to the society, and they have to elect you in order to move forward. The way the organization also functions is that if you don't belong to the association, you don't have a lot of the privileges of being an oral mastery surgeon. For example, uh, discounted insurance rates. Uh, for example, access to a lot of uh, information, journals, and whatnot. So it's critical that almost every professional belongs to an association. And that association dictates. And so that's why I got involved. I got involved because I want to see if I could make a change. And, you know, one of the things of making a change at a, in, in doctor terms, at a cellular level or at, you know, at a, uh, different levels. So yeah, I think I one of the positive things I think is I make changes individually to patients I treat. But I was thinking, you know, why not try to make a change at a, at a different level and as an organizational structure. And that's why, yeah, at a macro level. So that's why I went into that area. And so I was lucky enough to not only get elected from my state, but eventually become president of the entire organization, the National Organization of All Medical Surgeons. And with that, uh, I guess I, I became well known enough and respected and whatnot that I was also involved with an international organization. And with that, you know, I broaden out. That not only now are we looking at an association level, but what about that regulatory level? And I was asked to be on the board, um, state dental board. And uh, so that's. Uh, elected by your peers, but appointed by the governor. And so I was lucky enough to be appointed by the governor at that time. And therefore I got into regulation as well. Uh, because of my background now having knowledge in regulation and having association level knowledge, um, I also, uh, in part of my background, you, you probably uh, may not remember, but I was also vice chairman of the Department of Oral Mass Surgery at Washington Hospital Center. And so 
I was for uh, almost 10 years, not only in private practice, but I was also directly involved with educational residents, teaching residents, full-time residents at the time, and doing those cases as well. And so with that in mind, I was appointed to be on the Commission of Dental Accreditation. The uh, Commission of Dental Accreditation, which is called CODIS, the ODA, actually governs, regulates, and accredits all the dental schools in the United States, all of the residency programs, all the hygiene, assisting, and nursing programs. And so I was able to then determine accreditation issues. And so uh, just recently, I've been asked if I wanted to participate as one of the, uh, on the board uh, of uh, Jacob, which is the Joint Commission on Hospital Accreditation. So there's a bunch of these issues that, that I'm involved with now that has nothing to do with quote unquote clinical uh, oral surgery or medicine. Also because of my background in medicine and also because of going to medical school, uh, even though I don't have the actual pedagogy really license, you know, I'm also a liaison to the, to the medical board as well. And so I'm able to then cross over a bunch of different issues. Another part of oral mass special surgery, which a lot of people don't realize, is that you have to have significant training, training equivalent to an anesthesiologist. And so you'll see that in many oral mass special surgeries, especially board certified programs, they are taught anesthesia. So when you go to the office and, for example, do an office surgery, you have anesthesia. So you take out wisdom teeth, you know, or the oral mass special surgery will actually give you the IV and put you to sleep to do it. And so that background in anesthesia, and then I did take the boards in anesthesia as well, just to give myself uh, you know, some more credibility. And therefore now I'm, I'm asked also to be a consultant for the American Board of Anesthesia and Dental Anesthesia. So, so there's a bunch of these different areas that I've kind of broadened into because of just background and experience and knowledge. And, you know, it's... It's an interesting comment that one of my colleagues has said is if you've been around long enough and done enough things, all of a sudden you become an authority. <laughs> and, and so, you know, some of these areas is where I'm going into now. So, and, and then obviously, you know, they're no longer clinical, but they're clearly, you know, from experience. Yeah. I mean, I, I think it's, it's so fascinating to contrast this with like my domain and data, right? There is virtually no regulation, right? There's very few of these. Um, these unifying bodies that are, are are regulating things, and, and there probably should be in the future because of artificial intelligence and and like the ethics associated with that. How do we govern these things? How do we keep up up to date? How do we how do we keep pace with the the technology? But it, it's interesting to me how like the stakes are significantly higher in a one to one like medical scenario, right? Where it's like. On the surface, me writing a line of code is probably not going to kill someone. On the other hand, if someone makes the wrong decision because of a wrong policy in medicine, like they're, they're alive directly at stake. The scary thing to me, though, is that with the data profession, with a lot of the decisions that are being made, I don't really see it as being that different, right? If, if we put something into the world that is like devastating to human life or, or like is you know, ethically absolutely terrible, what, what are the repercussions of that? And how, like, how do we regulate that? How do we respond to those types of things? That's, that's a scary issue. And hopefully we can learn from other communities like the medical community um, that do have more organization around that. On the other hand, like what are some of the challenges with this really sort of rigid structure of regulation, right? Like medicine, to be perfectly honest, doesn't move that fast, right? But my domain, like, there's new innovations. I mean, medicine, there are new innovations every day, but you have to go through FDA approval. You have to go through all these things. In, in data, things happen like this. It's like boom, 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 and it's going. And there isn't the slowdown process of, of approval. It's just released into the world. Um, you know, how do, we, how do we, you know, circumvent some of the, the negative parts when, when this is happening so fast? Well, yeah, the, the hard part about what's happening in today's world is, how, is the speed of lightning that information is being doled out. 
And the, the problem being in the old days, in traditional ways, you know, there's always, the, you know, the way science works is that it has to be repeatable information. <clears throat> and so if you turn out some data and it's repeatable and reproducible on the same type of format, then that data is really kind of verified. Unfortunately, today's world, it's not. And I mean, you look at today's world like false news. I mean, you know, it's released by whatever source, <clears throat> it's picked up by whatever news channel, and it becomes news. And it's bastardized. They say it's like, <clears throat> oh, you know, it could be like this person was able, you know, this model was able to do X, Y, Z, and then it's a game of telephone, and it eventually it's like. So, so, the, so the real answer that I think that's happening is is is, is self policy uh, policing about what you're doing and the way the self-police in fact is show the data you need to show the data and what you do and what i understand you do that you often will show a project and you show the data as you do it and that data is out there for everyone to look at not necessarily to copy but to replicate if they can replicate your same data then in reality that data is accurate and that's that's the only thing you can do with that and that, that's how the world so in data science, the way I look at it, and, and you understand my knowledge of data science is minuscule, but from what I can tell in data that we use in medicine or in dentistry or in science is the fact that that data has to be reproducible under the same circumstances, and that becomes now has credibility. And so if you can repeat your study, you know, and this is one of the big issues going on with conflicts of data, and tomorrow you're going to say, coffee is good for you and then a data comes out says coffee is not coffee. good for you yeah. well, and the most the next famous data, one is the know, glass of red wine right exactly glass of red wine. and so the, the issue is such is that if the scientists would come up with their data and how they got their data and you know instead of trying to deceive uh, the person receiving it because i could say that i did six hundred thousand study uh, uh, you know popular study on this issue and this is the data i get but without showing the data and how to achieve it the question is credibility yeah. because it has to be reproducible by that source uh, i mean that's something i didn't think about and you raise a really good point is that in my profession it moves faster right but right. it's so much more vetable right like i can see if a model responds in a certain way that people are saying it will from my computer upstairs within like 20 minutes of the right. paper coming out. On the other hand, when you put policy into play, you really don't know the repercussions of it until almost maybe a year later, two years later, when you see when people have like made the mistakes. Yeah, and our, that's, our, that's our, terrifying. To me. Our downstream is much longer. Yeah. Interesting. So shifting gears just a little bit, I, I want to touch on two more, two more like main topic areas. So one is like personal philosophy and those types of things. And the other is like, I guess me coming into your life at some point and having having <laughs> having children. Um, regarding your personal philosophy or, or like things that have had a tremendous impact on you, was there what you would consider to be like a pivotal moment in your life, something that changed the course of your life forever? Um, and that yeah. Yeah, you well, know, I, I touched on it a little bit, but it's is in dental school when I realized that I really didn't want to do quote unquote dentistry as you as most people think about dentistry in the dental office to switch it over to do you know oral mass special surgery and to me that was pivotal because you know I really wasn't happy in, in dentistry I wasn't happy with the limitations that it produced one of the big areas of oral mass special surgery, and, and this is what I tell students and, and people that come to me for advice about professional careers and whatnot, is that oral mass special surgery has a full spectrum of scope of practice. You could practice anything in that area and get training for it. So <clears throat> a lot of people don't realize that oral mass special surgeons are the primary people that you will see for head and neck cancer now. They are the primary people that now do reconstruction. They're the primary people that you receive for trauma. So you go into a hospital, you know, people used to think like, I'll go to the ENT doctor or I'll go to a plastic surgeon. Well, those people are usually downstream and ENT has really gotten out of those areas across the country and in the world. And so 
the scope of practice is what's huge. And again, that pivotal moment in my life was being able to discern that of where I was going with it. The other pivotal moment was obviously getting married. I mean, once I got married, you know, one is my place of locale where I was going to stay. Um, in some respects, the decisions are no longer my decisions, which I was fiercely dependent on, but now is, is learning how to adapt to make decisions with another person and what's best for us versus best for me. And so those are pivotal moments that you, th you think about what occurred. What do you think the most challenging thing that you maybe ever had to do was? I think if I look at the most challenging thing, uh, I would say uh, running for president of, of uh, the American Association of uh, Oral Mass Special Surgeon. Uh, I think I alluded earlier to the fact that it is an elected procedure and you have to be elected by your peers. And it's a structure similar to like, you know, like most organizations, there's a general assembly uh, that's represented by oral surgeons from every state. And then there's a, a body that's the governing body, and then there's the leadership. And the uh, assembly is who votes for you. And uh, the makeup of the assembly uh, is usually about uh, a little over 100 people. <clears throat> And they come from all diverse backgrounds and communities of practice in oral vascular surgery. Uniquely, however, again, this body is mainly all uh, male Caucasians. Uh, there may be one or two that are women. Uh, but, and during my time on the assembly, when I belonged, I was the only uh, Asian at all, let alone only Chinese. Uh, when I ran for the organization president, uh, there was one other Asian from California, and there were two, three women who were actually in the General Assembly. But in order to uh, garner votes, uh, it's a political campaign. That's why you bring up the politics. I mean, I literally had to go to every state uh, organization and meet with their quote-unquote membership, and then subsequently elicit their representative vote for me. And every state is different. One state would have the state organization tell the representative who to vote for. In other cases, the representative would vote for whomever they wanted, regardless of what the state wanted. And so you really had to navigate, you know, the situation from state to state. And, you know, there are some states like California, that obviously there are a lot of Asians, or even like Florida. But you go to a state like Arkansas or even in Alabama, there are not that many Asians there. And they're not used to an Asian being a quote unquote a leader. And unfortunately, you know, one of the, the stigmas or stigmata that occur to that most Asians are leaders in academics, uh, leaders that are educators. But you don't see any Asians that are particularly leaders of an organization, president of an organization. And you do see some uh, that occur. But usually those are not, though they're elected positions, but usually they are hierarchical. So in other words, once you become secretary, you automatically get, you know, vice president. Kind of. And so you'll see some Asians or minorities be involved. But when it comes down to actual elections of this type, it's very difficult to require politics, it required being able to go out and meet and greet. And it clearly required me to really kind of go outside of my normal comfort zone which is to go to just a meeting where you know no one and then immediately try to win over the crowd. You know, I think that I'm very good at one-on-one. -on -one. I think small groups is easy to speak to. But when you start talking in a state assembly of you know, two or three or 400 oral surgeons and try to sway them at that time uh, with, you know, literally 10 minutes or 15 minutes of time they give you, uh, you know, that's a little bit different. And so that's something I had to learn how to adapt, learn how to speak in front of an audience of that type. So it's not an organized, you know, it's all extemporaneous, and often there'd be rapid fire questions. And, uh, you know, if you know the personality uh, and, you know, not being in, in, in medicine or, you know, personalities as such as that various type of personalities in order to be an oral medicine surgeon. You know, you had to have a very aggressive personality, a very independent personality. And so you're, you're dealing with a lot of people that are just like yourself. So so that, that becomes a little bit more complicated. So that, that was, one I think, one of the greatest challenges I had.
Because that's something also you're probably one of the things you're most proud of is being able to um, go through and, I mean, even if you didn't win, you just, I mean, you did win, but just going through that process of getting out of your comfort zone, like, you know. I, I think if you're talking about pride, that probably ranks four or five in my pride. I, I think I, if you're talking about personal pride, obviously having you as a son, it'll be my personal pride. Okay, so don't go too deep okay. But my professional <laughs> pride, to be honest about it, now that I'm retired, is the fact that I've practiced 40 plus years and I've had no iatrogenic morbidities, mortalities. In other words, I have not, to my best knowledge, and over you know, thousands of medical reviews, have not had any type of issue where I was the cause of greater pain or discomfort or death of a patient. And you know, if you talk about office space, you know, at the minimum, let's we'll say you know, eight to ten surgeries a day. Um, and if you talk, and you know, you're looking at the neighborhood of uh, eight to ten surgeries, it's forty patients a week. You know, you're looking at 200 patients for the month over time of years. You know, you're looking at about 4,000 patients over the course. You know, it's, you know, it's like 57,000 patients. And then you add to the fact that, you know, 100, 150 major surgeries a year over the last 40 years. And not to have harmed everyone, but believe that you've done professional good for every one of them. That's, that's the greatest professional pride you got. You know. That's incredible. Um, I think my last question regarding like personal, like personal perspective is related to, to like fear. Like, is there like, what are is there anything you're afraid of? Yeah, I, I think the fear that's carried me the most is not being prepared enough. I mean, I, you know, I think you know me well enough that I'm meticulous in detail to make sure that I understand what's going on, understand the circumstances never to underestimate the set of circumstances. Um, I'd rather overestimate. But the key element to, to anything, whether it's business, whether it's profession, raising a family, or whatever, is not being prepared. And to me, that's my big fear in life, you know, is not being prepared well enough. So, I mean, if you're talking about fear, that's, that's the fear I have. So how do you get past that? Because I think that in anything, every every single thing that we could do, we could always be more prepared, right? Like, h- how do you know when to, to like switch it off and just go and do it versus to stop preparing? Like, when, you know, like when do you know it's enough? So I think that, again, you know me very well. I mean, I'm, I'm a real organizer. And so to me is that once, whatever project, whatever set of circumstances, whatever survey comes up, is that I have zero time that I start, start time, and I have a zero time end time. And with that, I spend probably the first 20% of the time organizing what I want to prepare with. Um, I also have a mid prepared state, see where I am, a status check, and see what else needs to be done and then I have a final check. And, you know, I, I'm rigid. I am absolutely rigid on those issues. And, you know, that's the best you can do. That's the best you can call it at that time. That doesn't mean that something new comes up also, you, you know, you get dealt with. I mean, there's, there's no question that occurs. But, but the point being is being rigid in structure and rigid in your organization and really following your your game plan rigidly, you know, and allow for adaptability toward the end. And so, you know, there's no way to really know that you've totally prepared, but, you know, without that organizational structure in the game plan, I mean, you can't do it haphazardly because then you will forget something. You know, it's interesting. I think, I wouldn't say we diverge in philosophy related to this, but to me, like, preparing for individual tasks isn't as important as preparing for like the broader task, right? Like, let's say I'm giving a speech and I think it's important for me to prepare for that speech, but the like life preparation I've done to know that I'm a good speaker is what I feel is like the most important It's like, Oh, I've had these experiences. I know that if something doesn't quite go to plan, I, I'll still be fine. Like they'll be comfortable. 
Um, I, you know, I, I think you're hundred percent right. The preparation is important. And I, I think that I prepare adequately for almost everything, but I think that, I think you also agree with this to a certain extent, but I put a little bit more premium on the like broader life preparation than on the individual event preparation than you do. Um, you know, like it, uh, yeah, I'm planning this big trip. And I think that if you were in my situation where like, I don't exactly know when I'm coming home, you would be so pissed off. <laughs> but to me, it's like, okay, I know, I, I know, I'll figure it out. I'll, I'll get to where I need to be <laughs> do all these types of things, which I think is kind of funny. <laughs> yeah, and I, I, you know, if I'm, if I were planning the same trip, you know, that you have coming up, um, you know, I, I would have it, all of it organized. I would have my itinerary all set up. I would, I would clearly know in my beginning time and end time, and I, I would have everything mapped out to the detail, in, including, you know, all my Uber arrangements, my rental car arrangements, uh, and, and whatever, uh, to the detail that I, if we were, I, I would have, a, you know, take a break and take a tea time, and my golf tea time would be exactly at 2.10 on Wednesday. I mean, so in that respect, that's me. Uh, I, I, I don't play it quite as loose as you do. You know, you prepare and you, you're organized and you get it set up. But you allow for a lot of, shall we say, um, flexible time. I don't... In, inspiration. I, in, inspired time. Yeah. You know, I, I don't... I, I don't... Put you I allow for it to be exact. In other words, if I'm going to have inspiration time, it's going to be exactly... It's going to be this much time. Yeah, it's going to be this time at this date and this time period. So I know exactly what I so, so from that standpoint, I am... Uh, a little bit more anal about that kind of issue than you are. Oh, yeah, I, I think it is important that, yeah, like if I viewed the world the exact same as you did, I think that that would be a flaw in, in like your parenting, right? Yes. Where it's absolutely. like if, if we agreed on every, I mean, we agree on those things, but there's definitely things that I view differently. Um, you know, something I, I would ask you, I, I want to move more into like a parenting and, and our relationship is like, what, what's the most difficult part of being a parent? What's the most difficult part of, of raising someone or, or, or seeing them, you know, develop? The hardest part of children, of raising a child, in my opinion, this is my opinion, is, is to really understand. <laughs> is that they take videos of you sleeping and put it on YouTube? <laughs> <laughs> well, it, it, it's really understanding your child. Because if you don't understand your child and accept them for who they are, and that occurs very early in life. I mean, I was already talking to you about, for example, um, your cousin's uh, niece, who's, who's six months old. And she's already exhibiting her personality. And part of that personality is her attitude and how she reacts. And if you don't see that and understand that that's part of a child's personality developing, then it's impossible to establish standards and limits and establish, you know, the, and allow for your child to grow the way that child should grow. So the hardest part is really learning that because I think new parents and parents in general, they want to establish preconceived notions of how things are done rather than watching how a child grows and adapting to them and giving them the best type of education experience and growing up they can. You know, so I'm a, I'm a real believer in that. Uh, and so that's that's hard to do. It's really hard to be, you know, not allowing your child to be who or she is. Yeah. Well, I mean, I, I remember very distinctly when I was growing up, I played, I was very serious about baseball. In my senior year of high school, I decided to stop doing that, you know, after being like, after basically going through all the college recruiting and stuff for that and just deciding to play golf. And I know that was a decision that you did not understand, right? At the at the time, I mean, I, I grew up playing baseball. It's something I loved. I mean, it was a huge part of your life. I mean, we talked about how you wanted to be the catcher for the Yankees until you were 16. And, um, you know, I, I realized that individual sports were a lot more compelling to me. I had a lot more control of my own destiny. I saw that, in a, you know, in a weird way, like I had a coach in high school that I didn't see eye to eye with. And like, I wasn't going to get the opportunities doing things as part of a group where I was evaluated in a non-objective way. Whereas golf, for me, everything was quantifiable. 
right? I shoot a score, it's on paper. It doesn't matter how I got to that score, that's what matters, right? Like that, that's high place. It doesn't matter how big I am, um, how, how hard I throw, how, how hard I hit the ball, it matters what the outcomes are. Um, and I think, you know, again, you, I don't think you were happy with that, but like, you mean, you let me do it. And I think it turned out pretty well for me in terms of even my career and all these things. And, you know, I, I respect that it was difficult for you to see me do something that you might not think was necessarily the best at the time, but it was still my choice and, and I was able to go through it. Well, I think at the time when I looked at it, I, I thought <clears throat> there were other factors that were involved. And so I was not as negative as you may have thought it was. I mean, one is if you remember you had a labor and tear uh, on your, yeah. your shoulder, which uh, you know, clearly would affect the uh, baseball. Uh, also is, is that, you know, I, I realized very quickly that you really had a driving passion in golf and you had a waning passion in, in baseball. I mean, I could see that and I could tell that. I mean, that's one of the things that was going on. I think as much as I like baseball and I love baseball, and as you well know, I still follow baseball very closely. Uh, you know, I, I hated you to not participate in baseball or being involved with baseball or love baseball like I did. But going into golf, I mean, you know, that was your choice. I mean, you know, you had to live with it. I don't have to live with it in a lot of these decisions. And so, yeah, I, I just, I, I was more hopeful that you would still love baseball and be involved with baseball. But making the decision going into golf, that was your call. I mean, I, I was not going to in any way uh, if you will, deter you from what you thought was the best for you at that time. I mean, there were things that I wanted you to do in those early lives. And, you know, one, and I, I could tell you a couple of them. One of them is, you know, I was really kind of pushing you to do more weightlifting and be more in the gym, yeah, which, I which you really did didn't not want to do. do. That. Yeah. You know, but, you know, I didn't. I do now, though. I, I didn't push it, but the point being is I thought that was a better choice. And likewise, another decision that I really was trying to get you to do, but you didn't want to do it, and that was up to you. And that was applying to more different colleges, uh, more even Division three schools, and, and some other things, uh, you know, and, and some of the schools in Virginia. But, you know, you had strong opinions that you didn't want to do it. And I wasn't going to establish an authority saying, you do this and do that. I mean, you have to make your own way. And whether it is a good decision at that time or a bad decision, again, you know, you're going to have to live with it. And so I'm a real believer that you make a decision, you're going to have to live with it. And you'll learn from that because I think that you learn a lot from negative, even more so than positive decisions. And so I think in whatever decision you make even now as an adult, or whether I agree or disagree, doesn't weigh into it. It's just a fact that. You have to live with it as long as you learn from it. That's all I care about. Yeah. You know, if it's a positive for you, great. If it's a negative for you, what have you learned from it? And I think more negatives, you learn more, really, uh, than you do from positives. So, you know, that's where I am with, with yeah. those issues. I don't agree with that. I mean, I think, you know, I, I just had a jiu-jitsu tournament this past weekend, and it did not go as I would have liked in terms of my outcomes you know i won one match and i lost two matches and i learned so much more from losing matches than i would have if i had just won it would have been like a good outcome experience but a bad learning experience and i evaluate almost everything by two criteria like was the outcome what i wanted and was the learning like how much did i learn from it and this again was like maybe a one or two on outcomes but a 10 out of 10 on, on learning and I don't think if it went better, it, the, the learning would have been as as valuable to me. Make sure we go. Okay, there are eight um, So, something I, I'm always interested in is, like, what do you think about my career? Well, for for sure, it's your career. I mean, you know, that, that's up to you. You're the one that again, just as we said before, you got to live it, you got to deal with it, or not. You know, as a traditionalist, I mean, I don't quite understand the career. I mean, I don't. You know, I am, for, a, you know, the older generation, you know, I'm pretty current in a lot of the electronics and navigation. I mean, I don't speak the language, if you will. I mean, if you, you put in those terms, I mean, I can communicate, but I can't speak fluently. 
So, you know, I understand a great deal of what's going on, but I really don't quite understand all of it, you know. But the area is that if you're passionate about it, an area that you feel comfortable, or you feel successful about it, and it's, you're enjoying it, then hey, go for it. I mean, that's all I can tell you. I do believe, and I've told you this before, that whatever career you choose, you want to maximize your education, maximize your credentials, you want to maximize your preparedness and organization, and that in no way can your credibility or your abilities it ever be jeopardized because you don't have the right credentials or the right, you know, amount of um, credibility, you know. And so, you know, you make the call, you live with it, you know, and, you know. And you get all the perks. <laughs> you know, <laughs> perks is always good. I mean, I got nothing against perks, you know. Yeah. Well, so, so what would you tell someone, uh, you know, maybe a fellow parent that, that doesn't understand what their kid is doing, what their kid is passionate about it. Like, how, how do you how do you evaluate that or make that decision? I think so many parents care about their kids' success, and the reason why they push them into specific professions is because it's consistent. They want their kid to have as many opportunities as possible. I mean, from a pure entrepreneurial perspective, like I think my profession is almost risk free, not completely risk free. I think it's significantly less risky because I have so many options in how I can make money, in how I can grow. You know, if I'm if I'm in a working for a company or if I'm a doctor or something like that, let's say I'm a surgeon, I hurt my hand, my career in surgery is virtually over. Right? If I am working in my line of work in a business like I, I get banned from YouTube, I still have all these other different things that I can do and have opportunities with. Um, you know, how do you view that? How how do you describe that to someone where it's like you know, you're, if your kid's happy, that's, you know, that is kind of what's important. Or, or you know, how do you mitigate some of that risk for parents? Well, again, there's, there's a couple of factors that issue. So number one is, is that, you know, for your audience, I, you know, I'm an older parent. And so most of the data scientists that I've seen or I've seen you with or, or what I've dealt with in various professions, because we use data uh, analysts and data scientists all the time in every area that we work in. And most of them are all in their you know, 20s and 30s. So those parents are usually now in their 50s and 60s, not quite as old as I am. And so they should be a little bit closer to this whole world of uh, electronics and communications that are a little bit more than my generation. And so they should be a little bit more knowledgeable. and. Basically, what goes on now in today's world is such is that the world is not like it was 10 years ago. It was not like it was 20 years ago. Clearly, it's a different world 30 years ago, and it's in a different time zone, literally, you know, 40, 50 years ago. And so what we thought was successful is no longer what's successful. And there are limitations to traditional um, professions. You take, for example, medicine. Medicine is totally limited by by all the insurance that goes for it. So medicine and the practice of medicine is, is got overlays of changes that occur and, and limitations and scope limitations. Law is the same thing. I mean, look at the number of lawyers that are out there and the, and the type of law is being practiced. And, you know, one of the big things they talk about is that the more lawyers than there are anything else, more rats. I mean, I hate to say that, but that's literally what they're saying. So, 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 so the bottom line is, is this stage of the game is that it is a whole new world. And in this new world, there are whole new professions. And these new professions um, are just as credible, just as real, just as viable as the old professions. There's no difference. And so, you know, that changeover is something that you, you have to understand. I mean, look at kids in, in grade school that are using computers already. You know, I know when you were uh, growing up, you know, computers in high school was a big to do. I mean, I've got a, a grand niece now who's in the second grade, and she has her own computer that she brings to school. You know, I thought it was a, a play toy, and... You know, I was told no. I mean, she actually takes it to school and they use it. And that's how they use their math is on the computer. They don't use it on writing. So 
this is the new world. And I think, you know, professions like yours and data scientists, that's a new profession. It's just as legitimate as being a doctor, a lawyer, or Indian chief. There, there are not many Indian chiefs in yeah, even, even less now. So uh, one last thing is, you know, are there any questions that you've never asked me that you that you would like to ask? You know, I still don't know how to hit, how to hit a sand shot <laughs> out of fluffy sand and make a spin. I mean, I still don't know how to do that. It, and even though you've told me, you never showed me how to really do it. Well, so, you know, yeah. great, maybe I just show you. I just haven't ever told you, I guess. Yeah, I'll, but, we'll work on that. Okay, so that, that's, that's a real big question I have. Uh, well, Dad, thank you so much for doing this. This is very special to me. I actually, I've learned a tremendous amount. Um, I'm so happy we could have you on the show. And I think everyone else will probably gain quite a bit from, from your experience. Well, well I enjoyed it. I mean, I, this is a great experience for me. And it's great to sit down and talk to you about what's going on. Uh, we don't have conversations like this per se. Our conversations usually are snippets, you know, or uh, on different uh, topics and different areas of day-to-day uh, -day kind of stuff. But it's just sit back and talk about it. And so I'm, I'm honored. I'm very honored that you asked me to do this. And again, this is an epic episode, you know, you're 100. So I think that this is really a, a big honor for me. So I, I thank you and I appreciate that. Awesome. Thank you. All right, son. Right.